Uh, as Dwayne said, I'm from the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, my background is actually in zoology and biochemistry, but over the last 30 odd years, uh, I seem to have become an environmental chemist for various reasons that we'll see some of today. Uh, so what I, I want to talk about today is really uh, looking at a, a variety of uh, organohalogen compounds in the environment. I've been working on those for many years in various forms. Uh, and recently, uh, <coughs> Our interests have turned more towards uh, untargeted screening, uh, and we'll talk about that extensively. So what I want to talk about is uh, untargeted screening of a variety of uh, organohalogen compounds. We'll talk about some uh, data from uh, sediments, a uh, little bit of work on house dust samples, uh, and then we'll finish off with some uh, discussion of disinfection byproducts. I'm uh, getting a bit close, I see. Um, again, this is the work I'm reporting is a, is a team effort. Um, the three key people that we'll be uh, talking about today are uh, Dr. Hui Peng, uh, who's a uh, postdoctoral fellow in our lab, uh, postdoc extraordinaire, I like to call him, uh, who's now moved on to a tenured position uh, at University of Toronto. Uh, Tina Watts uh, is a master's student working with me, uh, looking at uh, disinfection, water disinfection byproducts. Uh, and a close colleague of mine is Professor John Giese, uh, who I've been working uh, together with as a colleague for, for more years than either of us care to remember. Uh, so again, uh, a lot of what I uh, talk about today will be uh, the work of these uh, colleagues of mine. So my personal halogen history, and I was thinking as I was putting this together, um, I guess it goes back to working in the 1990s. I was mainly focusing on organochlorines, um, PCBs, dioxins, furans. Uh, this is when I was in a lab uh, in New Zealand, uh, doing a lot of work on marine mammals, looking at accumulation uh, of these various uh, compounds, and some other POPs work as well. I uh, went to Michigan State University uh, around about 2000, did a lot of work on uh, perfluorinated compounds. <coughs> um, over that 10 year period, um, really sort of uh, brought these things to the forefront uh, of environmental analysis. More recently, so in the 2010s, we've been working extensively on bromine and iodine, uh, particularly naturally occurring compounds of bromine and iodine. I guess that would mean for the 2020s, we should be moving on to the one remaining uh, halogen, astatine. Rough estimates of its uh, concentration in the Earth's crust are about 0 0.0004 yoctograms per gram. Uh, I don't think I'm going to go there. I think I'll just hang up my lab coat and some of you younger folks can start dealing with that one. So we know clearly this is what uh, this uh, symposium is about. Uh, many of the organochlorines are uh, persistent, well-known uh, persistent organic pollutants. That's why we have the Stockholm Convention. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of extensive work on these uh, mainly anthropogenic uh, contaminants. However, natural compounds also uh, incorporate halogens uh, for various reasons. Um, and uh, some of the, uh, the microorganisms that are able to synthesize and to break down these compounds uh, have been a source of quite a lot of research uh, in the past as well. Back in the early, I guess, teens when we were starting to look at organobromine compounds, things like the PBDEs um, and polybrominated biphenyls and looking at uh, these anthropogenic compounds, we were trying to do a mass balance to determine of those compounds how much of the total organic bromine can we account for with the known uh, anthropogenic brominated compounds. So just in a, uh, a quick summary, looking at a study we did with polar bear, uh, albatross and tuna, uh, we determined both non-extractable bromine, uh, extractable organic bromine, uh, and these identified uh, organobromine compounds. So summing up all the compounds we knew uh, anthropogenically that were out there, we can account for around about 0.01 at most percent of that total uh, organic bromine. So there's a lot of bruminated stuff out there that we don't really know about. Uh, and significantly, we can also extract uh, quite a bit of that bromine. So there's a lot of extractable organobromines out there that we need to start thinking about, looking at, and see what they're doing. Are they anthropogenic? Are they natural in origin? And what are their, their implications for toxicology uh, compared to uh, these things that we, uh, we are more worried about? So we were doing extensive work, as, we, as I said, on a range of, of halogens. So 
we sort of pulled together some information from a range of studies. Uh, we published this in ESMT back in about 2010, um, looking uh, at the, again, the percentage of uh, extractable organohalogens we could account for with known uh, anthropogenic compounds. So for the, as we've seen for the uh, organobromines, we can't account for much of it by, uh, with man-made chemicals. Organochlorines, we can, uh, in these range of studies, account for a lot more of the organochlorines that are out there. And when we come to organofluorines, we can account for most of it, uh, at least 25% uh, of it, um, because um, the generation of these organohalogens, particularly the chlorines and the fluorines, are very energy intensive. So uh, of living creatures, humans are the only ones that can afford to put that amount of energy into synthesizing chemicals. So these chlorines and fluorines then uh, are mainly anthropogenic in origin. The bromines and the iodines then are much more uh, common in nature, uh, much lower energy levels required to synthesize those compounds. So the, the, the bulk of the organobromine and organoiodine compounds out there are going to be natural in origin. And, and our interest is looking at the relative toxicity uh, of those various compounds. So just as a sort of a, a summation of what we, we've said uh, so far is really all per uh, and the great majority of polyfluorinated compounds, and by poly I mean more than two, more than three. So when we're talking five, ten fluorines uh, on a molecule, they're going to be anthropogenic in nature. Uh, naturally, it's just not worthwhile putting that amount of energy into synthesizing a compound. And indeed, the vast majority of organofluorines of any form uh, are anthropogenic in nature. There are uh, very few natural organofluorines, um, 1080, uh, fluoroacetic uh, acid, uh, is one natural compound uh, used as a, a pesticide. Uh, but again, containing only a single fluorine molecule, single fluorine atom. Uh, and the majority of all those other natural organofluorines only have a single fluorine on them. The vast majority of these organobromines and iodines uh, should be of natural origin. Uh, and many of these bromines and iodines are in fact polyhalogenated as well. Uh, and the vast majority of these natural compounds, we really have no idea what they are. Uh, or what their significance is relative to anthropogenic compounds. And so we really need to look at the significance uh, of these natural organohalogens uh, relative to their toxicity. And we've done a lot of the scanning work to identify the compounds and we're now doing work on, on the toxicity. But I won't talk much about the toxicity today. The method that we, when I say we, I mean Hui Ping, uh, basically developed um, close to two years ago now. Uh, we call the dipic frag method. Uh, it basically uh, uses LCMS um, to identify organobromine and organoiodine containing compounds uh, based on the presence of that halogen uh, atom uh, as a characteristic fragment. Uh, we're doing a lot of this uh, LCMS. Again, a lot of these compounds, the natural compounds particularly, uh, are relatively polar, relatively water soluble. Uh, so it's easier to do this LCMS. Problem being, ESI, APCI, we can't uh, fragment them to release these uh, halogen ions. So we have to go through uh, and use uh, ESI, APCI to isolate the parent ions uh, and then go into HCD collisional dissociation to break off that characteristic fragment uh, and see uh, what those compounds are. So again, uh, our instrument for doing this uh, is the Orbitrap, uh, a Q-Exactive uh, instrument to be precise. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with the system. Uh, you can see some of the information on it out there. Uh, source, quadrupole, uh, HCD collision cell, uh, and then into the Orbitrap. So I won't dwell on it. Um, things that are key for this method as we apply it. Uh, high mass resolution, uh, better than 2 ppm mass accuracy. High sensitivity, we can use the quadrupole to isolate the precursor ions and then do MSMS uh, with the HD cell and the Orbitrap. Uh, and we can also run multiple acquisition modes simultaneously. So full scan, MS, uh, as well as MSMS acquisitions at the same time. So all uh, things that we really need for using this method. So um, just a quick example then, uh, once we've gone through uh, that uh, HCD cell, 
Uh, we find these characteristic um, halogen ions, again 79.9, no surprise, that's bromine, uh, and then the other bromine isotopes here as well. And parent compound here, 245, so um, fairly standard sort of MS-MS sort of approach, except we're using the, uh, the quadrupole uh, to isolate um, precursor ions. So we need to identify the parent compounds. Um, we use that, we isolate intact precursors uh, and then use a series of data uh, independent MSMS acquisition windows to go and look for those bromine uh, or iodine fragments. Uh, and we need to do uh, a whole range of uh, small DIA windows uh, since we get a lot of overlap. As you'll see, we find a lot of different compounds. So we need some relatively small windows to separate these things out. Uh, it's also useful to uh, expand the dynamic range. So essentially we're doing a full scan here, and then we'll do a series of DIA, DIA windows, another full scan, then more DIA windows. So again, we're doing a lot of different acquisitions uh, simultaneously. Uh, but even then, to do these acquisitions uh, takes time, so we really need to spread out the mass range. So we actually do uh, 10 separate runs uh, with this uh, kind of acquisition uh, so that we can cover a mass range from down here M to Z 100 up to uh, 1,000. So we generate uh, a lot of different acquisition data. Uh, and getting all of that data together uh, is, a, is still a challenge for us. So the basic concept then is we'll look at, um, through the HCD, our bromine fragment chromatogram. Uh, we can also then, using our stepped collision energy during that MSMS, we can isolate the precursor uh, ion as well as the uh, halogen isotopes. Uh, so this gives us an idea of what the precursor alignment is. We can line up then uh, elution profiles for the bromine fragments and for the precursor ions so that we can identify uh, which of these specific compounds uh, contains those bromine ions. We can use uh, traces at different uh, master charges to confirm that. Again, the presence of the different bromine isotopes uh, helps us do this. And with the uh, accurate mask uh, capabilities of uh, the Orbitrap, uh, we can get very good estimates uh, for formula prediction uh, from, uh, from both the uh, full profile analysis and the MSMS analysis. Uh, and we can also use uh, some of the MSMS patterns to start extracting structures uh, from these various compounds. So it's quite a complicated workflow. Uh, just an example of that bromine fragment peak. In this case, we are running uh, in uh, an M to Z 220 to plus or minus 2.5, so that's the, uh, the DIA window, and we'll see a range of compounds in there. And on uh, example sediments from Lake Michigan, we'll get an average of about 15 organobromines uh, in each of those DIA windows. Some overlap with them, but all in all, we identified roughly 2,500 um, organobromines uh, in those sediments from Lake Michigan. Uh, again, just emphasizing using that step collision energy, we can, in most cases, but not always, uh, isolate precursor ions as well as uh, the bromine fragment. Uh, and this, again, gives us better confirmation of what uh, that the mass for this precursor ion is. Uh, aligning the profiles, uh, again, gives us confidence. So here we've got the bromine fragments, and here is the precursor ion fragment. So that alignment then is showing us that these are uh, those brominated compounds. Isotope peaks we've talked about. Uh, and we can use isotope ratios in here as well uh, to start deducing certain uh, structural characteristics, number of bromines, presence of chlorines and bromines. Uh, it's a big workflow. Uh, and in fact, if Hui Peng hadn't been able to program in R very uh, extensively, uh, we could not have developed uh, this basic uh, R framework that pulls all of that data together. We've got multiple runs over those multiple mass ranges. We've got the DIA windows and the full profiles, uh, isotope ratios. All of those need to be pulled together uh, using this R workflow. And I think that's really one of the key things that I want to key take home messages for today is we really now with these Orbitrap systems are collecting such a huge amounts of data that we're running into problems with data interpretation, particularly uh, for untargeted screening. So some of the results then, uh, sediments from Lake Michigan, these colors don't show up particularly well. Um, 
This is uh, the diagram of something like two and a half thousand different peaks. Uh, of those, um, we detected something like 2,000 uh, precursor ions for those peaks, uh, and we were able to deduce formulae for about 2,000. Uh, and that's about 1,500 unique organobromines in those Lake Michigan sediments. So looking at retention time here, so basically uh, it's a reverse phase column, so we're looking at some of the more hydrophobic compounds. Um, the ranges uh, or the types of compounds we're finding, we do find PBDEs, hydroxy PBDEs, but the concentrations down here are real low. So these are relative intensities. Again, we don't have standards for most of these things, so we can really only look at relative intensities. Uh, PBDEs, hydroxy PBDEs down here, um, brominated fatty acids, known uh, natural products, uh, relatively high concentrations compared to these things. But surprisingly, there's a lot of things up here in very high intensities that we really did not uh, expect to be seeing. Uh, and one of them that really jumps out and that we're working on more are uh, these uh, brominated carbazoles. Um, which uh, until we published this work hadn't really been identified as a, uh, a contaminant of, uh, of interest. Uh, we've done some toxicity work on them, they do have some toxic potential, uh, but there's really not a lot known about them. Uh, but we do find them in, in, uh, in lots of other samples as well. Just looking at uh, the mass ranges of these compounds, again we're talking uh, relatively high uh, contents of uh, relatively high molecular weights, 300 up to about 600, uh, even up to 1,000. Um, this diagram here then uh, indicates in colour uh, the bromine number, so more bromines up here, and the relative intensities in the spots. So we'll see more of these figures as we're going through. So the larger spots uh, have obviously higher concentrations. Uh, the lighter colour means lower bromine, uh, number of bromine molecules, uh, atoms in the molecule. Um, moving on, we can use the same approach for iodinated compounds. It's a little more uh, difficult to interpret the data. There's only the one stable isotope of iodine, so we don't have uh, those two isotopes to, to help us confirm things. Um, but the method can still be generally applied. So we looked at, again, samples from Lake Michigan uh, and compared them with some samples from the Arctic. Clearly, this is sort of a discovery phase and we wanted to see what we might find in marine sediments compared to freshwater sediments. Um, so this is then our profile from the freshwater sediments. Um, for iodinated compounds, we're seeing a bunch of things, again, uh, not so much known on uh, anthropogenic uh, iodinated compounds. Seeing iodophenols, again, uh, carbazoles, this time iodinated, are up there uh, at relatively high concentrations. And again, we can see uh, distinct differences between uh, marine and freshwater sediments. So clearly a lot larger range of compounds in uh, marine sediments, presumably due to uh, iodine, uh, iodide concentrations uh, being available. So moving on from that, we then applied the method uh, to uh, some house dust samples. We had a student working on, uh, again, uh, flame retardants looking in house dust samples to try and assess exposure of infants uh, to these brominated compounds. And again, he noticed a bit of a problem with his mass balance, uh, looking at total bromine uh, and what we could account for with the BFRs, we were out by a factor of about 100. Uh, so we wanted to apply this method and see what else we could measure in this house dust uh, in the form of brominated compounds um, to, to really start looking at what uh, intake was like. Again, uh, this is the same sort of method, the same sort of picture, retention time, uh, mass to charge ratio. Uh, again, we see distinct groups uh, of these brominated compounds uh, in these house dusts. More than 500 compounds were identified, uh, and again, some of them uh, we knew. So we've got group one or two compounds up here, and then we've got this group three uh, compounds down here. And again, uh, a lot of the known uh, BFRs we can identify, but their contributions or in relative, relative concentrations are quite small uh, compared to some of these other compounds. And some of these compounds we really uh, didn't know what they were uh, at the time, so we had to do some, some further investigation. 
uh, looking at a heat map then uh, of, uh, again, this is basically concentration of these uh, different chemicals uh, by sample. Uh, so Hui Peng also does a lot of bioinformatics, so he likes to do these bioinformatic type pictures to see what they're telling us. So our group one, group two compounds uh, are up here. This is the BFRs, the known um, TBPH and the like. So the known uh, flame retardants, the known organobromines we were looking for. These are all the other organobromines, so lots of different compounds. Uh, and trying to find out what they were uh, was a bit of a challenge for us. Turns out um, that uh, a lot of them are in fact uh, belonging to uh, a group of chemicals, the, the azo dyes, so brominated azo dyes, um, that um, when we think about it, house dust, azo dyes used in dyeing fabrics and dyeing all sorts of other things, it's fairly obvious that this is what they would be, but we needed to really go through this process of untargeted screening, identify compounds of interest, then we can go through, start predicting structures uh, and get standards to actually verify that these are the compounds uh, that are in there. Uh, so that actually was published uh, earlier this year in uh, Environmental Science and Technology. Um, and, and I guess the other significance of this is we uh, are following up a lot of these studies looking at uh, relative toxic potential of these chemicals. Uh, and again, so we see here uh, for that particular azo dye, 2 bromo 4 6 dinitro aniline, uh, we've done um, basically a carcinogenicity assay, uh, and we see effects at around about 1.2 micrograms per mil. House dust, we've seen about 1.7 micrograms per gram. So we're in the ballpark for these things being uh, an issue of toxicological significance. So moving on then to, to Tina's work, uh, looking at um, uh, iota brominated disinfection byproducts uh, in water treatment. Um, again, really started as looking for, for natural brominated compounds. We worked with uh, a water treatment plant uh, and they said, well, come on, take some, take some samples as we're going through our treatment process and, and see what comes out. So we applied then uh, this, uh, the same method uh, to look for uh, brominated compounds there. Water disinfection, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, basically for deactivating pathogens, sterilizing the water to make it safe for human consumptions human consumption. Trouble being uh, natural waters uh, that our sources contain natural organic matter. Uh, if they contain that natural organic matter, inorganic precursor ions, and we add an oxidizing disinfectant, which most disinfectants are, we uh, generate a whole variety of disinfection byproducts. Uh, principally, uh, these, uh, particularly bromine and iodine in these cases, in the cases I'll be talking about, use an oxidizing disinfectant, you will generate hyperbromous acid, then this hyperbromous acid will react with uh, various organic matter compounds to generate a whole variety of different brominated things. A lot of water treatment plants, uh, this is not really a large issue because a lot of the organic matter is taken out uh, before the water is uh, chlorinated. Uh, just so happens that the plant that we're dealing with uh, is one in Saskatchewan, uh, provides uh, drinking water for roughly 40% of the province's population. Uh, it's located near Moose Jaw. Um, and is, the water is, uh, in the lake is known to have relatively high natural content of bromide and iodide. Uh, a lot of the geological structure is the bottom of a uh, former ocean, uh, and so a lot of that bromide and iodide is, is coming from that sort of source. Uh, and the lake is also quite eutrophic, so it has a lot of organic matter. Problem with the plant is, this is the plant, this is the source water, it's about two miles away, so they've got a very long pipe. Uh, being good water treatment specialists, they chlorinate the water right at the lake before any of that organic matter is removed. Uh, and it's got a lot of bromide, a lot of iodide, so they're generating a lot uh, of these uh, disinfection byproducts. So really the goals we were looking at was comparing methods for extraction. Uh, again, we're talking untargeted screening. We want to incorporate as much as we possibly can uh, in each of these analyses. Uh, and then also looking at some of these novel uh, brominated disinfection byproducts. So, um, there are known disinfection byproducts, clearly. Trihalomethanes, haloacetic acids have been known for a long time. They're regulated. 
We know they have uh, carcinogenic potential. Uh, there's been roughly 600 other uh, organohalogen uh, disinfection byproducts noted, but even those 600 really only cope account for about 50% uh, of the organic halides uh, that we find in, uh, in drinking water. Uh, and many of the unregulated compounds uh, seem to be more toxic, particularly than the chlorinated derivatives. So looking in the literature for what we could find, we know that iodinated compounds are more toxic than brominated, more toxic than the chlorinated. So generation of these particular forms is, uh, is a concern. Uh, we did the same sort of uh, DIPIC fragment method. Again, we generate these libraries uh, of large numbers of compounds. We have a variety of, looking in this study, I've looked at it a variety of different ways, so different solid phase extraction techniques, uh, different columns um, used for the separation, different ionization methods, uh, and different pHs for the, for the SPE as well. So again, generating large amounts of data. And what we've done uh, using that DIPIC method generated uh, then a library uh, of a whole range of these uh, brominated and iodinated uh, disinfection byproducts. What we find for the, for the brominated compounds is again there's a large number um, that are generated during the water treatment. So this is the raw water uh, after, uh, immediately after chlorination. So we see a range of products. Again, if we compare it, we see uh, lar quite large intensities for these uh, more uh, water-soluble compounds. So these are the more polar compounds. Um, we can see differences again with APCI, ESI and APCI. So that means we've got to really make sure if we want to cover the entire range of chemicals that we're using the appropriate methods to look at all of those. If we just compare with that picture we had in the Lake Michigan sediments, we can see in these chlorinated waters, uh, again, these axes, are, these graphs are slightly different. Uh, this shows the fold change uh, in a particular chemical uh, relative to its concentration in the raw water. So clearly we're generating a lot of these things when we do this disinfection uh, and high intensities for a lot of these lower chlorinate, lower uh, halogenated compounds. Um, so haloacetic acids were found, uh, but again, uh, they weren't the most abundant. And some of these novel uh, brominated products uh, were also in, detected with similar abundances or even greater abundances. And even the top 50 of these uh, brominated disinfection byproducts we could identify uh, contributed about 35% of the total mass. Um, so we really focused on these top 50. Uh, again, when you've got 1,500 compounds to be looking at, you've got to prioritize it some way. So we'll start looking at the top 50 uh, and then working down uh, to the lower ones. So of those top 50, we were able to predict 41 um, of the um, structures for the 41 of those uh, using accurate mass, MSMS data. Um, problem being we can't find analytical standards for a lot of these compounds. So a lot of it's going on uh, the accuracy of the mass uh, and the MSMS data. Um, of these 41, we found a lot were aromatic acids and phenols, again, much more uh, polar than our classic pops. Um, and we also found heteroatomic compounds, so with nitrogen and sulfur uh, in, the, uh, in the molecules as well. And one group that really jumped out were the sulfonic acids, uh, halogenated sulfonic acids, a uh, relatively new uh, group of compounds. Uh, there is some literature out there on them, um, but again, we're finding uh, quite high concentrations of these things. So the conclusions from that work then are really that, you know, there's about 700 that we can identify out there, uh, and most of them have not been previously reported uh, in drinking water. Uh, the method showed good precision uh, on actual drinking water samples, um, depending on uh, the conditions that you use, so different uh, SBEs are going to give you different results. These novel heteroatomic DVPs uh, were there at relatively high abundance. Uh, and we've got ongoing work looking at, uh, again, as I said, the toxicity of those top four, top 50 uh, disinfection byproducts. So overall, what we've been doing with all of this work then is trying to generate uh, libraries um, of accurate mass uh, and MSMS data. Questions then become, how do you format those? How do you make those available? 
places like MZ Cloud we're looking at um, as, as repositories for those uh, or other means of dissemination. We're also talking with Thermo about um, working with them uh, on database generation. Um, there's a need for additional advanced uh, data processing algorithms for this untargeted screening paradigms. Um, the, the software that we get with the instruments really doesn't cope with it. So we're in, in the realm then of writing our own R scripts or getting someone to write R scripts for us. We're using some of the other um, software such as MZMine and the like, which is not really uh, designed for doing this particular kind of analysis. Uh, we, as I said, we're focusing on a lot of those high abundance chemicals to look at toxicology. Um, but again, a lot of this technology would not have been possible, a lot of these studies would not have been possible without that Orbitrap technology. Um, the mass resolution, uh, the speed of analysis, speed of data acquisition, ability to capture a uh, full profile and MSMS data at the same time uh, is just a real, a real game breaker for the kind of work, for this kind of work. Lots of people involved, uh, lots of different groups that have, have helped us with provision of samples. Uh, so I think I will just leave it there and take any questions. Thank you. It was very interesting. I have a question that is not really related to the way you did the analysis, but more about the toxicity testing you plan to do for the main compounds that were detected, because we're having a similar process in my lab, and the question is always how can we test the toxicity if these are not available as standards? Yeah, absolutely, and we've um, <clears throat> worked in those areas for, for a number of years, decades actually. Um, we use a variety of cell-based assay systems, uh, things like the k assay, but not the k assay. Um, so we're looking at things like oxidative stress assays, uh, DNA damage assays with comet assays, uh, and a variety of other, uh, some of them gene expression kinds of assays. Uh, but how do you extract them from your mixture to be able to test them separately? Yeah, we do fractionation, so LCMS uh, fraction collection, look at what are the toxic fractions, then we'll go through um, different stages, so each fraction we then refractionate it, spread those compounds out more and more. Each of the fractions we again look for the activity that we're looking for, so that we're basically decreasing the number of compounds that could possibly be in a fraction. So when you're down to maybe five compounds in a fraction, you've accounted for 95% of the toxicity of the sample. Uh, then you can start to say, okay, we've got five compounds. One of them is causing a problem. It becomes a more feasible option to generate or have synthesized each of those compounds and test them individually. So, uh, you know, we would call the, the actual separation process is basically, um, we call it, um, toxicity mediated identification. So fractionate, fractionate, fractionate till you get a fewer, you know, an easily handleable number of compounds um, and then follow the tox use toxicity to follow those through the separations. Okay, but you synthesize them. You don't do the toxicity testing on the fractions that you collect with your LCMS. Yeah, yeah okay. we do fractions, we do toxicity tests on those fractions. So that's how we can get down to, uh, and that's why we use cell culture systems because we need much smaller amounts of material for those. And then when we're down to maybe four or five compounds in a particular fraction, uh, then we can look at going and getting those synthesized. It depends on the relative toxicities. You've got to, once you've isolated everything um, down to one or two compounds, you then have to go back and think, well, what's the whole toxicity of the sample relative to just these compounds? If they're very toxic, even if they're at low concentrations, they may be significant. Great talk. Uh, having grown up in Moose Jaw in the 60s, uh, <laughs> I can appreciate what you said about that's, the water there. That's when they built the plant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, just curious, you know, indeed it's, the whole of Saskatchewan is, is built up on, on salt beds and, and whatnot else. So if we're looking at drinking water from, from other areas, uh, would you say this issue is, is localized to uh, Saskatchewan or? or um, we are looking at other areas in Saskatchewan, so we're working with the Prince Edward well, I, folks I, I as well. Mean, yeah. Going into British Columbia is going to be different yeah. or, or California. Or and a lot of plants that are using groundwater as opposed to surface waters are going to be completely different. Um, 
you're right, they will be completely different, but we're just trying to get a, a handle on what the problem, the extent of the problem is. So the first thing to do is to take a worst case scenario. And really, yeah. Buffalo Pound is pretty much the worst case scenario. Um, since we've been sharing this work with them, they've now decided that they're not going to chlorinate uh, at the lake. Um, they're just going to, again, built back in the 1960s, the best thing to do with a water treatment plant was to disinfect it the hell out of it, and keep everything disinfected all the way through the plant. They realise now that that's causing them more problems. They're still in compliance with all their trihalomethane analyses, although they did slip on one of their uh, regulatory measurements last year. They were a little bit over for one of the trihalomethane, so they do realise it's a problem. Uh, they've taken out that now initial uh, chlorination. Um, but even then, after they've done that, there are still some products that are generated. Uh, and a lot of their treatment does take out a lot of the initial um, compounds that are generated, but not all of them. And we find other things generated as we go through their treatment system as well. So. But yeah, it's the, looking at the worst case scenario and then seeing if we can generally apply that. Uh, question is, have you um, correlated any of this data with epidemiological studies data on cancer clusters or bladder cancer or other? No, we have not as yet. Um, we've really been only doing this, the drinking water, we've only really been doing that for three years now. So we haven't really got to that sort of, that sort of stage. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you all. It was a really great talk. Uh, I have maybe a suggestion it's regarding all these data you're producing right now. Maybe it would be a good idea to start building using Z Vault. I don't know if you saw that. It would be a great to build it from there all the MSMS data. That will help you, I think, maybe more than MZ Cloud. That one thing. Another thing is the compound discover. I know it's used for metabolomics, but yeah. I, I'm trying to use it for some organic pollutant, and it seems it's really processing data much better. It, it has, I need to modify it a little bit, but mm. I think it has a great potential. My next question is uh, regarding the DIA method you use. So you run the same sample if for, so you isolated every handle and then inject it again, but then and move your windows. That's what you, and then you do the yeah. DIA for that handle. Yeah, and yeah we, do, we do 10 different runs. Each of them's 100 mass units, okay. covers 100 mass units, uh, between 100 and 1,000. So yeah, we do yeah. 10 different runs on the sample. Because I'm thinking about it, if we can apply it also for the view, because you use the Q exact, because you have only one detector, which is the, yeah. which is the orbit trap. But if you mm -hmm. have the fusion, you have two detector. Yeah. Then you, you don't need to do that fractions. You can mm -hmm. run it at once yeah. and get all the data. Yeah, I don't have a million run. dollars to spare at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can help you with that. <laughs> not with the money. But, but, <laughs> yeah. but also more to your point about yeah, trace finder. We've got trace finder, and I'm, I'm trying to do this as well. Yeah. Um, but really, I think the main focus here is discovery, discovering what the compounds are, and then from that, transitioning over to a much more direct method, so we won't be doing that DIA once we've identified a compound or a mass and a, and a mass spec, mass spec profile, then we can just use it uh, in an ordinary mass spec method. So building your data is what will be really great for data yeah. As you go on, it will be easier now as you just started. Yeah. But later on, it will be you have the database for all the MS and MS, and then you can compare it much easier. Yeah, absolutely. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much. Great talk.